Good evening, everyone. I am your host and instructor, Lainey Shaughnessy, and welcome to Spindle TV, your best source for CNC CAD CAM training videos. Spindle TV is brought to you by Digital Woodcarver, inspiring your creativity and providing you with the tools to create your own unique masterpieces. Hello, hello. How's everybody doing tonight? All righty. Good evening, Peter. Good evening, Jared. Hope y'all are doing well. Hey William, how are you doing? We're gonna get started here in a few minutes. We're gonna uh, give everybody a chance to pop in. Yes, sir. Yes, sir, William. I have been on the move. Always on the move. Trying to get some things uh, accomplished. Let's see how uh, well tonight goes. Hopefully it'll go uh, pretty well. We're going to have a uh, class that'll probably, hopefully, uh, if all goes well, the instructional part of the class will last about uh, 30 to 45 minutes, if so. Um, and then uh, we're going to open up the floor for some Q&A. We're going to kind of do a little bit of a combination. We're going to have uh, some Q&A tonight. Uh, one of my children just walked in the door, so you might hear some heavy breathing. That's my dog. <laughs> Lay down. <clears throat> she gets a little winded walking around with all that weight. <laughs> Good evening, Richard. Richard, we still got to get together at some point in time. I believe you had uh, called or texted me about getting together. We still need to get together sometime. <coughs> So hopefully things are going well on your end and, uh, you know, uh, new and exciting things are happening for you. We're going to make a, um, uh, it's a very basic uh, project. We're going to do a, 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 a maze puzzle, a uh, marble maze uh, puzzle for, uh, you know, marble games and things. And uh, just something, it's a nice little project. It's a great little game project to make if, uh, uh, where you can make a bunch of them. And uh, they're great gifts. Uh, they're great items that you know to sell if you're uh, you know selling things. Uh, and uh, you can really kind of uh, come up with your own pattern for your maze and things. I'm going to show you uh, the general process for creating a uh, maze. And there's a lot of videos out there on the uh, World Wide Web and YouTube and things. Uh, you know, people making different types of mazes. You know, single-sided mazes, double-sided mazes where the marble will drop through and, and go to the bottom side or the other side of the board all kinds of things uh, we're gonna make a, a very simple maze and just show you the process and and, and uh, uh, get you to uh, understand the thought concept and then from there you can take it uh, as far as you want with your designs and, and everything and uh, uh, then once we're done with the uh, the uh, instructional get you to where you can take it from there uh, we'll go through and uh, open up the floor for some Q&A all 
All right, so uh, it's 7.05. Let's go ahead and let's jump in to uh, the Vetrix software. Uh, I'm sure other people will pop in. They might, uh, you know, uh, sit this one out. Uh, it's kind of a, you know, you know, there's marble mazes all over the net. So uh, we'll see if any additional uh, users come on in. And we'll go from there. But let's go ahead and uh, get started. So for tonight's project, I am going to be working with a 15 inch uh, long piece of material. It's going to be about 10 inches wide. Now, of course, the width and the length, that's going to be totally up to you uh, and your design, uh, what you do uh, with it. And for me, the material is going to be about an inch and a half thick. So basically, uh, I would take two, three quarter inch pieces of material and, and, and mount and glue them together to create an inch and a half thick piece. Uh, of material for carving. The marbles uh, that we're going to be using are quarter inch in diameter and I use uh, metal ball bearings, uh, quarter inch uh, steel ball bearings. You can usually find them on eBay and Amazon. Um, you can get them in packs of uh, you know 50 or 100 uh, relatively inexpensively. Um, I, I believe uh, pack of 100 uh, from different users or something on Amazon you can probably get them for about you know four to seven dollars you know for a hundred of these uh, steel ball bearings you know quarter inch diameter uh, really nice I thought I had one laying around that I could show you guys and I'm looking around and I don't so uh, we'll have to kind of uh, imagine now in this project, I will be touching off on the surface material for the Z0 position. I'm going to be uh, using my uh, DWC quick set, so I will be starting off the center, but you can also start off on, uh, or I'm starting off the left corner, sorry, the bottom left corner, but you can start off center or any of the one of the corners of the four board, uh, you know, the four corners of your board or your material. And we're going to go ahead and click OK, and that'll take us into our setup. Now, first off, um, I'm going to go ahead and draw in my quarter inch diameter uh, marble here. And to determine how wide the track needs to be, uh, a good method that uh, I used that you know, I learned uh, from someone that was doing maze puzzles and things uh, uh, a few years back, uh, was that from whatever your marble size is, whether you're using marble or a ball bearing or whatever, whatever your, your, your game piece is, let's call it that, we want to have a 25% uh, increase for the trail that uh, that marble is going to follow. And the easiest way to, uh, to determine what the size of that trail with that 25% increase is, is to take and make a copy of this so we can go ahead and we can just hit under the file operations we can hit copy and then when we can we can turn right around and paste that copy right on top of the original shape and so now basically I've created a duplicate and that duplicate is selected that new item that I just pasted well, if I go into the size tool here under the transform objects menu, uh, right here we can type in a size or we can type in a percentage. And if we come in and I just said, you know, having a, a, a trail that is 25% wider than your marble or your, your bearing or whatever the case, whatever you're using is, the best way to do that is, is right now our marble is 100%. So if we come in here and type in 125 percent and click apply that will give us our trail width or you know our, our size you know that that uh, the width of our trail and so <clears throat> if we were to look at that size it's going to be 0.3125 and so that is going to be a magic number for us we're going to use that uh, uh, you know throughout creating our grid you know so knowing that uh, we can take our part and just kind of move it off to the side our little marble and all 
and I'm going to, this piece is going to have some handles on the outer edge, uh, you know, for holding the, the game piece to be able to tilt it back and forth and things. And so the, <laughs> that's so true. That's so true. Let's get actually show you what's going on over here. <laughs> Thank you, Jared, uh, for that. Um, so let's uh, kind of back up a little bit. I did not have the Vetric software showing. And uh, we should be uh, showing the Vetric software now. Wonderful. After all of that, uh, I'm glad someone caught me uh, early. Uh, so I've got a circle in here that is a quarter inch in diameter. And as I said, if we take and make a copy of that by selecting copy under the file operations and then hitting paste, we're pasting a copy right on top of itself, uh, basically creating a duplicate. Now that duplicate is selected. So if I go into the size tool under the transform objects, I can now, uh, either type in a size or a percentage. And here is where we want to type in that 125%. So basically it's size plus 25%. And when we click apply, that creates our the size of our trail, okay, which is 0 0.3125. And so that's where we were up to before uh, Jared pointed out to me that we were not actually showing the Vetric program. So thank you for that. Um, Ronnie, uh, if your screen is black, you may uh, want to refresh your browser and try to come back in. All right, so knowing that our marble is a quarter inch diameter and our trail that the marble needs to roll in is going to be a 0.3125, then that, that 0.3125 is going to be kind of our magic number. And we're going to use that throughout the program when creating our grid. Now, before we lay out the grid, I want to uh, create the outer shape of my part. And so I'm going to use my rectangle tool here and I'm going to just draw a rectangle on my uh, 15 by 10 inch board. I'm going to draw a rectangle the, uh, from, by snapping from one corner to the next to create that rectangle border. And on that border, I, I would like to have the corners rounded and I'd like a two inch diameter on that rounding. So I want my corners to have a, a nice two inch diameter rounded uh, path here. Now I'd like to, while I have my rectangle tool open, I'd like to have uh, some handles in here to be able to hold this part with. So I'm going to start off with drawing a rectangle and this rectangle is going to be, um, Think about you know being able to get your hands in there and everything. I'm gonna go with about an inch and a quarter wide, and four and a half inches uh, is about appropriate, you know. And uh, I'll get the position in just a moment, but I want to see where my center game area is gonna fall. So before I get my game area in here, I want to take this rectangle, and I want to go into node edit mode, which is the second icon on the edit objects tool. And when I'm in node edit mode, I want to click on this top and bottom line. I want to right click on, put my mouse right on that line. And I want to turn that line into an arc. And that's going to just give my handle a nice little rounded in there. I'm going to do the same thing on this lower line down here. <clears throat> I'm going to right click and turn that to an arc. And now I've got this, you know, arced handle. Well, my handle doesn't need to be that wide or that long, should I say. So I'm going to come in and uh, I'm going to hold down my shift key. If, by double clicking on this object, it puts it in transform mode for me. And while in transform mode, if I hold my shift key down, I can grab this lower um, 
point and I can you know size my handle appropriately and by holding the shift key it's gonna size both ends so I'm gonna reduce that down to right about there it's a decent size handle and I'm actually gonna kind of uh, bring it in just a little bit from the back side not much so now if we look at the size my handle has a length of um, Let's let's actually uh, do this. Uh, let's go. Let's round this off. I'm unchecking the link x y so I can change both of these values. Let's go 4.75 in length overall length, four and three quarters, and I'm pretty close to one inch there. Let me look at my tape measure and see if my fingers can fit in a one inch handle. Uh. Yeah, I can, let's go one and an eighth there and click apply. There we go. That looks about right. Now, with this handle, I want to make sure it's centered on my material in this position. I want to make sure it's centered from the top to the bottom. So if I hold down my, or not hold down, but if I select my alignment tool, which is the last icon on transform objects, on the align to material, material, I want to make sure it's centered from top to bottom. That's this third icon here for the align to material selection. So get it kind of centered up. Uh, Ronnie, pop back in and let me know if you uh, if that resetting uh, worked for you. Now, now that I have that positioned, I can go ahead and mirror this to the other side. So I'm going to open up my mirror tool. I want to make sure that I create a mirror copy and make sure that's selected. And I want to flip it about my job center and I want to flip it horizontally. So that'll create my other handle on the other side. And with that, now uh, I can kind of focus on my play area. Now my play area is going to be 12 inches wide and six inches in height. And I want this um, 12 by six, I want it centered on my play area. So I'm gonna go in and I'm going to come in. Actually, uh, that six is supposed to be an eight. Let's go eight inches, not six. Let's resize that real quick. 12 by eight. There we go. And I want to center that on my play area, so I'm going to open up my alignment tool once again and select my middle icon for align to material and get that centered. Now, on that uh, 12 by 8 area, my handles, as you can see, they're coming into the play area, which we don't want. Uh, so I am going to go ahead and reduce the size of them. Uh, I will bring them down to about one inch, one inch. Let's go ahead. I should have. That's what I was thinking about to begin with. But let's go with it. Uh, there we go. And I'm going to bump that back a little bit. And I'm going to go ahead and delete this one because I want to just mirror copy this one over again. So we're going to just flip that horizontally and mirror that. Now, once I get um, once I get my grid created for the uh, maze game, then I'm going to go back and round off these edges. I want the game area to have some rounded edges as well. But for right now, while I'm creating my grid. I'm going to leave this rectangular uh, shape with sharp points. So knowing that my trail needs to be uh, 0.3125, I'm going to basically, and I need walls, of course, in between that trail. Uh, depending on how thick you want your walls to be, uh, we, would, we would typically add the wall thickness to that uh, trail, you know, size of 0.3125. And 
generally when I when I, you know when I learned about making mazes and everything, the number that has always worked well for me is a half an inch. And so what that means is, is I'm going to start off and I'm going to draw a line. And I'm going to snap a line to the bottom corner of this inner gameplay area here. And I'm going to drag my line to the other opposite corner and snap and left click to and space bar to finish off that line to create that line. Now, I want to offset this a uh, certain distance to create my walls. Um, and that uh, is going to, I'm going to use the offset tool and I'm going to be working with a half inch uh, for the uh, total overall uh, size of that 0 0.3125 plus the 0 0.1875 so that y'all know uh, for that half inch which means if I took that half inch and I subtracted my 0.3125 from it and hit the equal sign that's going to give me my 3 16 my my 0.1875 and that's going to be my wall thickness and I'm going to offset this outward uh, and um, actually inward should I say and I'm going to click offset and now I've got these two lines here that are 3 16 inch apart and they're going to represent my walls okay now from here I'm going to create an array and this array copy is going to have the space of my marble path along the y-axis. Y is up and down. Okay. And it's going to be the gap. That's going to be the gap between the walls is going to be that, that marble path, you know, that 3.3125. And for this, I'm going to have one column and however many rows will fit into my uh, 12 inch area and from uh, playing with it earlier uh, it's going to take 16 rows so if I go ahead and hit copy on this that will create my walls and then my marble trail my wall marble trail wall marble trail the wide areas of the marble trail uh, it, you know part of the grid so now, now that I have that, uh, all of those lines created, while they're still selected, I'm going to align them, align them to the center of the rectangle. But before I, before I align them, I need to group them together or else they'll all align on top of each other. They'll stack on top of one another. So the group option is the edit objects menu uh, the first row fourth icon or it is the letter G on uh, your uh, keyboard shortcut is G for group and now that those are grouped I can have them selected and I can select that rectangle last and when we're using the align to selection tools we are aligning the objects that we have selected to the last item in the selection. So the last item I selected was my rectangle. So now we're aligning all of these lines to the center of this rectangle. So if I click on the middle icon for center, uh, it will center them out. Now what I need to do is I need to create a copy of these but rotated 90 degrees to create my grid. And so with those uh, walls and trail spaces uh, selected, uh, we can go ahead and rotate them. But before we do, we're gonna click the copy button. So we're gonna just click copy and then we're going to go in and rotate those on their center on their center 90 degrees now when i come in and hit the paste it will paste that original copy back 
where in the position that it was copied from. So when I click paste, it will put the original or make the copy back where the original was pasted from or copied from, should I say. Now, <clears throat> my grid lines going vertical now do not go all the way to the ends of my play area. So I need to go ahead and um, get them over there. So the first thing I'm going to do is ungroup them. And I'm just going to focus on the two outside left ones first, and I'll group those together. And I'm going to offset those a half an inch, 0.5. And I'm going to go outward a half an inch, and I'm going to click the offset button. Oops, we need to go inward. I'm sorry, folks, not outward, inward. And I'm going to click the offset button once, twice, three, four times okay that'll bring those over to there now I'm gonna select these two here on this end I'm gonna hit the letter G on my keyboard to group them and those are gonna get offset outward by a half inch and we're gonna click the offset button once twice three four times so now this has created the grid that we're gonna create our trail within. Now the first thing we need to do is kind of do some cleaning up. So we're gonna trim up these lines uh, so that they are trimmed up to our grid outline, to our rectangle, to our play area. So we're gonna just use our scissor tool. You're gonna to be using the scissor tool throughout the most of this project and um, it's going to uh, be a lot of trimming that we do. Uh, so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to go through and clean up all of these lines. So I'm literally going to go through and start uh, trimming them. Notice that my scissors will not open on those lines because those lines are grouped together. So they have to be ungrouped. Let's go ahead and trim this away. Now once I get this to a certain point, we're gonna move over to one that I have already started, and then we will finish up on the one I've already started. Now notice these are grouped together so the scissors won't trim them away. Now I'm gonna take a minute and close this tool and I'm gonna click on this and group was the G key, well ungroup is the U key, but it's also the fifth icon on the edit objects menu but if I hit the letter U it'll ungroup same thing here select this and hit the letter U to ungroup those now I can continue my trimming so if I come in here and just run through this uh, rather quickly trimming these lines away you're gonna get a workout for your left mouse button we're gonna go ahead and trim those away and I'll show you on the bottom side a shortcut way of uh, doing this without having to trim everything one by one. All right, so the top is trimmed to that grid, but let's look at the bottom. Now, how would we do this without using the scissor tool? What's a quick and simple way of doing this um, without having to use the scissor tool? Well, if I come through and select my lines here, and I come over to my little uh, trim selected objects to the last selected object tool, our trim tool. If I open this up, if I hold down my shift key and I select on that rectangle there, I can clear everything outside of that boundary and it will trim all of them away for me. Okay, so I could have done that up here, but I wanted to show you the scissor tool, the interactive trim tool, where we're actually using the scissors to snip away. And then for the lower part, I wanted to show you the trim tool. So with a trim tool, the objects that we select first, and I'm gonna hit Control Z to undo this, the objects we select first are the items that we want to trim and the last item, the last selected item, is my boundary, what I want to trim to. 
and I'm either clearing everything inside of the boundary away or everything outside of the boundary away. And in case, in this case, it's everything outside of that rectangular boundary. And when we click clear, it will remove everything outside of it. Okay. All right. So now, remember I said I wanted my uh, outer border to have some radius to it too, instead of being square, I wanna have some radius to it as well. I'm gonna go ahead and do that now. Uh, I'm gonna open up my rectangle tool and I'm going to uh, create an internal radius of, I'm gonna go one, one inch and click apply. There we go, nice little rounded uh, corners there. And once again, I'm gonna use my interactive trim tool. I wouldn't use my regular trim tool for this. I could, but it's just as easy to grab my interactive trim tool. And all I'm doing is, um, <clears throat> all I'm doing is trimming away. What is, uh, something is grouped together. Oh, everything is grouped together. Let's U for ungroup. All right. With my uh, trim tool, I can just come in and trim these little corners away. Zoom in uh, to where you're working. Uh, so your, uh, you know, if you ever click on something and it's like, man, the line's not going away, zoom into it so it knows which line it's uh, trimming. And also, we will repeat that for the other three corners. Uh, we will come in here and trim these away just to clean up our design totally not really necessary but uh, I want them clean for a specific reason because I may want this uh, game to have a plexiglass cover to where the marble drops into a hole in the plexiglass and it's kind of trapped in the trail until it pops out of the hole on the bottom of the board uh, that way um, you know game pieces can't go flying off off or getting lost or anything you know while you're you know sometimes kids get radical with those things <laughs> all right one more corner just zooming in and we're gonna trim away these lines all right, so with these lines, let's zoom in here and trim these away. One more and two more up here. Okay, so basically with my grid for my play area laid out, I wanna zoom in here and I wanna tell you, the wide squares represent the path. The narrow squares, these skinny squares and all, represent the walls and so we have to create a path where our marble is going to go now in order to do this we're going to create a new layer and this is going to be called our marble trail as you can see i already have a layer up here called that that's for the other design that we're going to move into in just a moment uh, and uh, we're gonna give this a color so it differentiates from these black lines here so we can see it. Uh, we'll give it a color of orange. And now with that layer active, <clears throat> it didn't want to let me name it Marble Trail because I already have a layer called Marble Trail. So Marble Trail Path will work for now. Now with that layer active, now anything I draw in here from this point on will be put onto that layer because I want the trail separate from the play area and the grid. And so the uh, we're gonna start with our polyline tool. This is what we're gonna use to create our path. And so as we come through, we gotta find an area where we wanna start. Now I'd like to, if I, if I do have a plexiglass cover, um, I'm gonna have a hole cut in that plexiglass where the marble will drop into, and I want so I don't want to be starting too close uh, to my outer edge and things. So I want to kind of find an area in here um, where I want to start from, and, and and this seems to be a good spot right here. So now, if I click, that's gonna create my line, right? So now we're just drawing a path. 
So, and my path is usually going to be, uh, in, in, when I go to turn a corner, it's going to be in, in the middle of one of these wider square areas. So I'm going to click here and, and turn a corner. And we'll come. Now notice I snapped. I'm going to undo that. Notice that I actually snapped to that line. I don't want to do that. So this may be a good time to turn off your smart snapping and your geometry snapping when you're freehand drawing like this. That way it doesn't try to pull down and snap to those points because we're freehand drawing a trail. So we're going to come in and we're going to turn the corner. We're going to come down and I'm literally just kind of now you just kind of freehand uh, drawing a trail where you want to go. And when you when you create a path like I'm going to use my space bar now to finish off right here for a minute. When you create a path, you can also create fake or false trails as well, you know, that they get trapped into or something. So I'll come back up here and kind of create a little false trail that will dead end there. Um, and then I'll come back and I will continue creating my game part. Now, from here, we're going to stop here for a second. And... Um, we're going to uh, we'll switch over to the other one that I've completed uh, but I want to kind of jump ahead to what happens after you create your trail and so when we create our trail we have to clear the path and so basically all of the lines let's get out of the line tool here so I have my arrow all of the lines that are touching our path our you know our, our our poly line you know this orange line here we're going to be trimming away all of the lines that are touching making contact with that and that's going to clear that 0.3125 path for us so let's look at what that would look like so i would come in here and start clearing away around my poly lines now my poly line turns a corner and once again, it turns another corner and another corner here. And you can kind of see the path we've created. Now we're going to continue. All right, let's move over. And like I said, you're going to get a workout, a lot of trimming. We're going to scissor trim all of these lines away that are making contact with my orange poly line. Anything that is touching it will get trimmed away. That poly line is my marble. Think of your marble rolling through this trail here. And so we're clearing that path. Let's get around this corner and then I'll show you. Let's get around this corner here. And if we were to take a quick moment uh, and notice what I did. What did I do, ladies and gentlemen? I, while I was trimming these lines away, did not change out of the marble trail where my polyline is. So everything I just trimmed turned orange because it wasn't in my maze. Uh, my maze layer was not active. So what that means for me is I need to go back and select everything that's orange except for my polyline and I need a move I need to move move those items back to the correct layer so that way they're black again and now I need to make sure that that maze layer that I'm that my grid is in is active while I'm trimming. Okay, I've got a couple of lines here that I need to move over. This one too. And because I, you know, because I while I was trimming, I had that trail path layer active. Everything I trimmed got moved over to that active layer. 
And that's what we want to avoid because it becomes, uh, you know, a pain in the butt. So as you can tell, we've, we've created a, you know, we've started creating our path here and we'll continue on in just a moment to uh, finish it off. Uh, but I do see some, let's move them back where they belong. There we go. All right. So oh, look at there. See what it, it, it causes a little bit of a uh, hassle when you don't have the right layer active and it happens to the best of us. We get busy in the design and we forget to switch layers and um, you know, it becomes, uh, you know, apparent that we're very quickly that we're working in the wrong layer because everything starts turning the layer of that color. And that's the one thing I like about layers is we can separate those items, uh, you know, by color and um, you know we can really differentiate and again right now I'm back to uh, trimming everything that is making contact with my polyline my correct layer is active so nothing is going to turn orange on me <laughs> all right so now this comes around the corner here for this false trail that we went off into so let's get the false trail trimmed away and then we'll go back and I'm going to throw a measurement on here so you can kind of see, uh, you know, uh, so you can get the, oops, don't trim away your polyline. All right. And so we go around the corner here. And it doesn't matter your polylines, you know, crooked and all that. This is just a little path showing, you know, that we're, it just gives us a line to show us where we need to be trimming. Um, so it doesn't matter if that line is crooked or whatever, you know, as you see, I'm going up and down and all, we're just creating a path. All right. So we come around the corner here and let's move this down. All right. And for now I've ended right here. So let's take a look this path, this wide open path. Now that we've created, if I were to pull a measurement on it, and I'll just do a horizontal measurement uh, from the uh, one side of that area to the other, you can see that it is the 0.3125. That diameter of our trail, you know, that, that our marble is going to be rolling in. So that's what we're creating. We're trimming, you know, uh, and so these little areas here are going to be our walls and stuff and our, our, bar our barricades and all. Now, <clears throat> Once we have the trail completely trimmed away around our polyline, you know, going all the way, you know, however you make your maze, make it complicated for them. You know, you can make an easy maze, you can make it complicated, you can have a lot of, uh, you know, different paths and all, but make it complicated for them, make it a challenge, make it fun. Um, but now we need to define the walls and uh you know the path for our pocket cut that we're eventually going to be making a pocket tool path to cut out this trail well if i look here and if i select this well nothing about my trail the line on the left and the right side of <clears throat> my polyline trail my orange trail here uh, we need to basically be creating this we need to be creating a frame around this and how we do that is, is we have to do a little bit of trimming on the outside of these lines, these two lines, so that it kind of combines those lines together. So if I open up my trim tool, and let's say, for instance, give you an example, if I trim away this corner and this corner and trim away a couple of more of these lines, let's get a... Let's see if I can <clears throat> All right. So now if I were to select on these lines, now that I've trimmed some, you don't have to trim that many, by the way, just usually the corners and stuff. But now if I select on this, you can see that path that's been created right you can see it now here this path and this is the path we would use for our pocket cut 
And so if you notice, I kind of lose my path right here. It's shooting straight down when it should be turning the corner. And if I go into my trim tool, I can make it turn that corner by clicking here, here. Now it's forced that line to go around the corner and I can trim away a couple of more here. I really don't need to focus on any of these middle ones. If I come down to the corner where it turns the corner again and I trim away the corner lines for both the inside and outside, as we select this path, you'll see how now it's you know wrapping around that corner. Notice up here, I lose my path. It goes straight and dead ends. It doesn't come around. So I need to trim these two corner lines to make that line force around that corner. And um, so let's come over here. So this corner, I'll trim and define it. And this line here, I'll trim and define it so we can see that line right there. And what that does for me, let's come down here and do this side as well. And what that does for me is I can check it every once in a while by selecting on it and making sure that my path continues around and things. Now notice I've lost my path here it dead ends it doesn't come around the corner like it should that's because of these two lines here so if I trim away this corner and since my trail on both sides I can actually trim away this line as well and now we should be able to see that path has now turned the corner. But it dead ends up here. So we trim away. Let's force this around. And so we're watching what you're looking at. You're going to, it's a lot of lines. There's a lot of confusion and all. But what we're focusing on is that the trail, our 0.3125 trail, that is surrounding our polyline where that marble is rolling that path, is that it's all connected, these pink lines. When I click on either this left line on the left side of my polyline or the right side, that that path is continuing to follow the path of the marble. So as it comes around, okay? So <clears throat> let's continue on over here. Notice that my path comes around, it comes down and around the corner, but right here, this, this false wall, I've lost the other side here. So I need to do some trimming on the other side. So we're gonna trim here and here to kind of define that corner. And we might as well just go ahead and wrap around this corner. And then we're going to clear around this to define it. So now if we come down to the final part of the maze, I've got to, you know, if I look, if I click on my line, my polyline, notice that this goes straight down. You know, it's supposed to be following. It's supposed to turn this corner and kind of dead in here this one shoots straight down so let's go in and let's define this so if we want it to wrap this corner and then of course this corner you can start to see it come together so now if I click on my trail it's completely, you know, created. So if I turn off my maze, my path, if I turn that line off, you can kind of, now you get, you can see the trail that's being created. Now, once that trail is created, 
<clears throat> all of the rest of the grid can be deleted. Uh, it, it, it's, it's no longer valid because we're going to be creating a pocket toolpath on our trail. So we would use a pocket toolpath and that 0.3125 trail path, the width of that trail path, is going to be is going to be the depth of cut as well. Not only the width of the trail, but also the depth. And I'm going to use a quarter inch end mill. You can use, you know, uh, like a bowl and tray bit. That's a, you know, you know, maybe a quarter inch bowl and tray bit if you want rounded uh, edges and all. You can use a box core bit um, if you wanted to. I'm just going to use a regular end mill. And I'm going to go ahead and calculate this toolpath so you can see, you know, let's turn the color off. So we're creating that marble path, you know, that marble is going to roll in. Okay. And that's, and that's what we're creating. Well, if we come over back to the 2D view and let's take a look at, let's turn off um, our maze here and let's turn on the one that I've created earlier. Uh, I haven't, um, you know, I haven't started uh, trimming everything away. Uh, but I, I mean, I, I've started trimming things away, but I haven't finished. Um, I want to turn off the grid first so you can see the path of the marble that, I, that I've created. So my path of my marble is going to start over here and it's going to come around. Um, when it gets to around, there's a false trail here. Uh, there's a false trail here. And so it's a pretty simple path. These are false trails in this direction, but it's a pretty simple path to get to from start to finish. And I'm going to finish somewhere over here. And that's a false path that way. Now, I can, while I'm looking at it like this, I can say, you know what, that's not very, it's pretty easy, you know, and it, you know, it might, might be a beginner type maze. It's not really that challenging. We can kind of, you know, we can put a couple of more false trails in here and things. Well, we have to turn on our grid so we can determine, you know, where we could put another false trail and things. Now on my grid, I began uh, trimming the lines uh, for the path coming around and I got to my false trail here and I stopped here. So down here is where I would continue on with clearing the path, the lines that are making contact with the polyline. So you're going to have a lot of trimming to do. <clears throat> this is a false path here. So I'm going to continue there and then trim this away. And like I said, any line that is touching the, you know, the, the trail, basically that orange line that you see there, red line, whatever you want to call it, um, any line that is touching that trail uh, is getting trimmed away. And so we're going to race through this uh, to finish this up. So this is a false corner here. We'll continue that on. Let's see what's over to the left. All right. wrapping the corner and I believe you guys and girls get the concepts of things uh, that we're going um, if you have any questions about this as I'm trimming away please ask a question and I'd be happy to answer it while I'm clicking and trimming clicking and trimming this is where my false corner dead ends. That's the false trail. And then this one is the one that actually continues on. So while I'm here, before I slide over to the left, I might as well trim these away. 
lots and lots of clicking and trimming uh, you know depending on how you you know how complicated you make your path because not only are we defining the path in this particular step then we have to define the the full border of the path in that next step uh, by trimming and defining the corners to create that solid border all the way around the path because that border of the path is going to be the vector that we use for the pocket toolpath. And so I tried to create some false walls, false paths, should I say, not walls, false paths, paths. And I think you kind of uh, get the concept uh, as far as, you know, you're trimming away any line touching your path. This is why putting the path on its own layer and giving it a color because we need that color differentiated so that we can, you know, know what lines to trim. And like I said, your polyline might be all different angles and things, but it's all within that wide 0.3125 path. So it doesn't matter how you don't have to be straight and you know rigid so it dead ends there uh, this one will dead end here that false trail dead ends there let's come over and come back down continue around here so we're going to spend a few more minutes uh, trimming this up to uh, get it uh, finished and then we're going to open up the floor for q and a i just want to show you this very simple project but i'd like to get it uh trimmed away so we can create the pocket cut and so you can see how to create the walls you know the the outside border should i say i shouldn't say walls the outside border for the path and so let's zoom out let's see where okay over here Lots of clicking, lots of clicking, left click. You'll get a workout. I haven't found a shortcut for this uh, method yet. I uh, have, uh, oops, don't trim away your pie line. I have been experimenting uh, with a, a few options uh, for a shortcut, but as far as I've come across, uh, the best way and really way to do it is to trim away the lines create that trail all right we're getting around the corner here and um, let me know if um, oops if there's if you're if you are you able to wrap your head around this you, you kind of get the concept you know we're, we're trimming anything that's touching our trail uh, for the first phase of uh, clearing out our path and then we have to go back and define the border of the path by making those vectors those lines join together so that dead ends up into there Control Z is a great key for undo in case you accidentally trim away your polyline oops, by a, or a wrong line. Um, you don't want to, you know, accidentally trim away your polyline, your trail, whatever your path, whatever you want to call it, so you know what it is. All right, so we're nearing the end. It's almost there, so let's get uh, clicking as fast as we can. Oh. And that path that we're clearing, 
the path is, uh, because of the walls, the center of the path is uh, spaced basically a half inch apart. When we use that half inch number, uh, our 3 16 inch wall area and then our 0 0.3125 path area is a total of a half an inch. And so that with that spacing from the center to the center of the path is, you know, it's a half inch spacing. Um, all right, we're coming around the mountain when she comes. I'm not going to start singing. All right, so let's. Got a false trail here that needs to get finished off. There we go. And trim this away. Okay. Guys are a quiet bunch tonight. Wonderful. That means you get it. And you can make so many false trails. You can make, you know, whatever you want. Um, for your path and uh, just you know make it fun I'm gonna have at the finish line there's gonna be a hole in the bottom of the uh, that goes all the way through the part so when the marble reaches it falls out through the finish hole falls out through the finish hole and be, the reason why I'm doing that is because I uh, for my marble maze, um, you can have it where it's open at the top. Uh, I'm actually going to put a plexiglass cover and knowing that I'm going to put a plexiglass cover and knowing that my, uh, router bit, my, my ball bearing, knowing that my ball bearing is a quarter inch in diameter all the way around and I'm cutting 0 0.3125, my path, my path um, I should be able to uh, my marble should be able to roll with that um, you know that plexiglass cover on it but I'm gonna have it sitting in a pocket and therefore my depth of cut may be a little bit deeper all right so let's see what we did here I trimmed away the wrong lines. How do we how do we cut, recover from that without hitting undo undo undo? Uh, because um, whoa, <laughs> guess what Laney did? Turned on his layers, started trimming his layers, and did not. Did not uh, make his layer active. So, oh, oh, bad day for Laney. All right, so stand by. I have got to. Hoo, 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 ha, ha. <laughs> that makes you want to cry uh, when you get uh, because that is going to be a tricky dicky do um, let's see here let's give this a color other than black let's give this a color of pink okay and uh, let's turn off all the black and so basically virtually everything <clears throat> that I trimmed because I was near the end has gotten moved over to that other layer. <laughs> How do you recover without just going through and re- drawing it and starting over. So uh, how do we recover? All right, so let's look at how we would recover. So 
So the first thing we're going to do is uh, anything that is uh, grouped together. These are all, we're going to get it off pink because pink means it's selected, right? So that's a bad color choice. Let's go with green. There we go. All right. Uh, so I'm looking at my color trail. I know I've trimmed away all of these lines and things. So if I come through and select my path here, this path, I can kind of see it. Uh, this path. Brutal. Brutal, Miss Johnson. Brutal. Okay, I can delete that away. That's the... Let's see here. Let me make sure. Uh, this is coming around the corner. Coming up around this corner and around through here. All right, so, so far, this, uh, what's selected, I'm going to move back over to my layer one. Okay. That clears that up. So if I turn my layer one back on and turn off my Marvel Maze, that's, you know, it kind of gets me back in the game somewhat, right? You can see my path here. Now we got to focus on the rest. The rest. Oh, heartbreaking day. Um, You could, John, if you wanted to. You could, if you wanted to. That's a that's a that's a that's a nice way to do it. Um, let's. Uh... So John's question was, uh, could you not just draw a polyline then offset in both sides, uh, and don't even use a grid? Well, you can. Now the only thing is, is your polyline. You need to make sure it's absolutely straight, and all. When you're offsetting so your maze doesn't look all foobarbed. Um, let me turn off um, this maze here. And, you know, your path and all. I mean, you can have your crooked lines and everything, you know, where it's not that square and stuff. But it all depends on how you draw your polyline. Now, what John's saying is, can we not take the polyline and offset in both directions to create the outer part of the maze. Um, uh, so if I offset this <clears throat> in both directions, this is because my, see my line, John is not quite, wasn't quite in the center of the path. So it's gonna throw lines into one another. So it's not gonna be the best way to do it. Uh, but let's see here. Um, point three one two five divided by two. And offset. Uh, let's make. Let's do this. Uh, turn off the. Freaking, uh, I did, this is the third time now I've screwed up my layers. Um, let's turn that layer back off. Let's create a new layer. We're going to call this uh, offset. And make it active. Now, we're going to offset in both directions. Okay. And create a trail. So let's take a measurement, make sure we got our 0 0.3125, 0 0.3125. We'll do a horizontal measurement because it's got to stay a constant 0 0.3125. It should, oops, yeah, measurement, horizontal. We'll go from here to here. Okay, good. From here to here. Oops, vertical, that's a vertical measurement. Good. So, you know, we've got a path here. All right. Now let's uh, take the rest of the path. 
Let's go through and select everything. Offset in both directions. All right, so then all we need to do is join and trim some vectors. It's a good way to do it, John. Look at you, buddy, bro. Uh, that's a nice way to create a path um, without having to use the grid. I like that one. Um, I like that. So let's uh, let's look at John's method. Let's see uh, let's see how this does for us. Um, let's let's close this up. So we're gonna select on um, this path here and here and let's see if we can join with a straight line let's see if it there it goes that closes that off let's come around here all right let's use our scissor tool trim that that and that away all right here and here let's join with a straight line or even a, a smooth curve you know, let's do a straight line because we can put an arc on a straight line. Um, join with a straight line. Okay, that closes that dead end off. Let's come around here and trim away. May have just saved my bacon, John. Look at you go, buddy, bro. All right. Um, you know, my lines weren't all that straight, but hey, it kind of makes for a unique looking maze, right? You know, it's it doesn't, it's not, not perfect. Uh, let's join these two with a straight line. Let's join these two with a straight line. Oh, that joined somewhere else. Uh, let's join these two with a straight line. All right, now let's do some trimming. So we're clean up to here. This line, this line, this line, and that line. Nice going there, John. All right, this line, this line, this line, that line, that line. Uh, I'm gonna select that line. Oops, not that line. I'm gonna select that line and just hit delete. Okay. Let's come around. All right. So let's go ahead and join this and this with a smooth curve. Hold down your shift key when you're selecting more than one item. Wrap that corner. Nicely done. Uh, use our trim tool to trim these two lines away. Sweetness. Uh, these two here need to be joined with a straight line. And we need to trim away that, 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 and that. Nice. Let's uh let's trim away this and this, this and this, and let's join these two with a straight line. John, I believe you saved the day. Um, join with a straight line. Nicely done. Clear this path. Clear this path. John, I actually like this method uh, really well. Um, I really do. Pretty nice, pretty nice. Makes things a little bit uh, simpler. I uh, guess you don't really have to be too concerned about your polylines being straight and crooked and all that stuff. You just got to make sure that you have enough spacing. The grid kind of helps with the spacing. 
uh, like when you're drawing your pie lines, you want to make sure that you do not, um, that you do not, you know, put your poly lines too close together that when you create your offsets that they run into each other, then it would be kind of screwed up. But I mean, that's kind of where the grid helped, but I do declare, let's turn off our marble trail. This is part of my marble trail, this, this, and this. That's gotta get moved back over to marble trail. Let's look at our path here. And to confirm that everything, uh, my ball bearing is gonna be able to fit, you know, everywhere. Uh, let's do that a little different. That's not exactly a horizontal. Let's go from Yeah. That'll work. All right. John has saved the day. So, ladies and gentlemen, let's 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 reevaluate this for a minute. I started off with a grid. Clearing the path of which way we want to draw, which I've done. This is, you know, how I learned and it's what I've done, you know, for every maze I do. Now, John, being the ever so intelligent man that he is, said, hey, rather than using a grid, can we just draw the polyline and then offset both directions from that polyline the distance that we need. And so that 0 0.3125 divided by two comes to 0 0.1563. And so offsetting in both directions has created those lines, that spacing, which is what we would have to define anyway by doing additional trimming, you know, on our grid to get our corners defined and everything. Well, John says, you know, hey, instead of using the grid, you know, why don't we just offset everything to the polyline and look at that path that it's created. Honky dory. All right, so let's, um, let's go ahead and uh, turn off that and that for a moment. Let's go ahead and select everything within here except for my handles and my outside border and hit delete for a moment and let's turn our offsets in so we can see our maze and trail within there thanks to John's uh, intelligent thinking because that is slick as snot right there okay I actually kind of like that um, because as long as you are aware, the grid really helps with the general spacing. It does. You know. But if we use the grid to just draw the polyline to get that spacing and everything, and once we got the polyline and stuff drawn in, we can then get rid of the grid and just offset that polyline in two directions. That'll cut out so all of the scissor trimming. You know, so we could still utilize the grid to create the polyline so we get that spacing, you know, so our line, our, our main trail isn't too close to one another. And then once we have it drawn, get rid of the grid and offset in both directions that, you know, that distance that you need to offset. And uh, then go and close up all the edges and do some minor trimming. Yeah. Yeah, Jared, that's absolutely right, dude. It definitely applause because that was uh, slick as snot. It was. It was. It was. I like it. Okay, so now we'd come over and let's create some tool paths. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, John. Very slick as it going. All right, so we're going to go 0 0.3125. 
uh, with a quarter inch end mill. We're gonna calculate this. This is gonna be our marble trail. And to calculate that tool path, reset our preview and preview that selected tool path. All right, let's go ahead and create our uh, profile cuts. Now I'm gonna select the handles and the outside edge for the profile cut. Um, I'm gonna have to figure out a way to clamp this because uh, I, I I don't have a whole lot of clamp room here and, and a couple of tabs are not going to hold this big inch and a quarter piece around. So I'll probably uh, use like a double side tape or hot glue or something like that. But let's do our profile cut. And the profile cut, we're cutting through that inch and a half material. And I'm going to use the quarter inch end mill for that. Uh, I should be able to use the quarter inch end mill for everything. Um, and I want to be on the outside of the cut. Now here's where the software is smart, okay? Even though I'm cutting on the outside of the line, it'll know that I have an inside vector here and it'll reverse the tool path and it'll cut on the inside of the line uh, versus outside of this inner line here. It will automatically reverse that tool path. So uh, when I calculate this, if we take a peek at the, uh, we'll go into solid view here you'll see that the tool is cutting on the outside of the line for the outside profile, but for the inner profiles, it's cutting on the inside of the line. So it's smart enough to know that for us and all. Now, for that inside cut, let's preview that, or that, that, that profile cut. Now we may want tabs uh, on these inside cuts for sure. Reason being is that's a tight spot, that's a very tight radius right there for that router bit. And if this part moves in any way and gets jammed up, uh, then it could jam up that bit, especially when it's down in that inch and a half depth of cut. And we could risk uh, breaking the bit. You know what I mean? Uh, so we would definitely want to make sure we put some tabs on those two inside cuts. But for right now, I'm not going to add tabs because I want to kind of uh, remove this piece down. Now, Remember what I said, I wanted some plexiglass to cover this. Well, I don't want, I, I want it to be sitting down in a pocket. So whatever my pocket depth is gonna be, I'm gonna be using this inside border as the profile for that pocket. Um, but there's gonna be a little rabbit. You'll see that here in a moment. I need to make sure I have some room for screws and things like that. Well, if I look uh, around here, um, I've got all this meat in the corners where I can put four screws. So let's draw some vectors uh, to create my little pocket area and as well as my little circle start area as well as my finish cut through area, okay? So let's create some vectors. So I need a, uh, we're gonna use a small little, uh, oh gosh, maybe like a 624 screw or something. Uh, we'll call that, we'll call that, uh, an eighth inch diameter, maybe? I don't know. Let's, we'll try that eighth inch diameter. All right, and I don't want, that's where my uh, start point's gonna be, so I'll move this over a little bit. You know, here. And I'm gonna go ahead and just, while I've got it in transform mode with those boxes around, I'm holding down my control key and let's drag another one over here And control key, let's get over here. And somewhere up in here. Uh, I may want one in the middle, of course. So, uh, you know, in the middle of the part. So we're gonna go here as well and right straight down. Now I could, you know, to make everything line up all pretty and all, so it's all I can mirror these, you know. I can get my top ones and then mirror them uh, vertically, get them positioned where I want them. But, um, as a matter of fact, I'm going to do that. I'll delete those three. And to get those positioned where I want them, and I'm going to 
take those three items, three items, and I'm going to mirror them, flipping them vertically to the other side. Now this one got a little close to the trail, but it didn't hit the trail, so that's fine. Uh, now my marble has got to be able to fall out of the hole. Now here's where I'm going to turn smart snapping back on because I want to snap to the center of this and I want to create my 0.3125 diameter. Too many decimal points. Hole. And I might, I might even consider this going a little bit bigger. Let's go, because it's going to be falling out and everything. Let's go 0.4. Okay. And um, there we go. And that vector there is going to, um, I'm going to use that for a through cut because I want my marble to fall out underneath. Up here, same thing. I might as well just drag this bad boy, hold down my control key and drag him up. And with him, I can now, I can let go of my control key and I can snap him to the center. Right there. For my start point. All right. So, let's, uh, I'm not going to... Um, this start point here is going to be a hole that's cut in my quarter inch plexiglass or eighth inch plexiglass, should I say. Um, this hole here is, but this one's going to get cut through my board, uh, my inch and a half board. That's where the marble is going to fall out the bottom. Uh, if I was doing a two-sided project, that's where it would be falling through to the other side. But um, this, let's go ahead and create our pocket cut. Uh, first off, we got to mill the board down uh, to a depth that the plexiglass can sit flush in there. So, and we have to, whatever that depth is going to be, we need to add that depth to our marble trail pocket. So, for this um, cut here, we're going to do a pocket cut. And I'm going to just, uh, I'll probably just use eighth inch plexiglass. You know, a nice clear piece of Lexan, you know, eighth inch plexiglass. Um, and I'm going to use my quarter inch end mill for that. We're going to calculate. I'm going to, uh, I can offset it. That's fine. Uh, use an offset tool path and calculate. A larger diameter bit would be quicker, half inch end mill or something, you know. So we're going to uh, preview that selected tool path. Now remember, my trail is going to get cut down that eighth of an inch deeper, but this is going to be the pocket that my plexiglass sits in. You know. Now I need to um, these holes, uh, this hole here. Sorry, this hole is going to be a uh, through cut. With my quarter inch end mill. This will be my finish hole. Uh, let's try cutting all the way through the material. That would suck to get stuck in the middle of the board. <laughs> uh, get that decimal in the right spot. That'd be funny. All right, so let's calculate that out. Okay. Let's see here. So my marble will fall, capture, and fall right through out in my hand. You know, I'll probably catch it or something. I don't know. We'll figure out some way to do that. Um, all right, for the start hole, that's going to be in the plexiglass. So we're going to create a, a cut that we really can't simulate for the piece of plexiglass. It's going to be eighth inch thick, but we're going to be in that piece of plexiglass. Uh, I'm going to use the eighth inch end mill for this whole thing because of my uh, drill holes uh, and all. And um, the so even my profile cut cutting the plexiglass out, 
as well as the start hole. But the first thing I'm gonna do is my uh, drill holes on my sixth because they're the same diameter as my bit. So that will be a drilling tool path. Cutting uh, through that eighth of an inch with my eighth of an inch end mill. These are gonna be the screw holes. I could even do a chamfer if I wanted to, a small little chamfer. So the screws, uh, uh, depending on if I use, uh, you know, round head, uh, button head screws, or if I use pan head screws, um, I could use a V-bit, like a 90 degree V-bit to do a chamfer if I wanted to. Uh, but I'm just gonna, for right now, use my eighth inch end mill, which is eluding me at the moment. There it is. I don't need it to, it's it's an eighth of an inch, so I don't need it to retract and peck. I just want it to just go down and, um, it doesn't need to peck. So it's just going to go down and drill those holes. Zoom, zoom, zoom. So this is going to be the plexiglass. Holes. Now, if I, uh, it's, it's, it's going to be hard to simulate this. I can't really simulate it in this because uh, it's going to be on the place of plexiglass, but we've got our holes there. And then for the uh, start hole and the border, it's going to be a pocket cut. I'm sorry, a profile cut. Not a pocket, what am I thinking? Profile cut, cutting that eighth of an inch. I'm uh, gonna use that eighth of an inch end mill while I have it loaded to do the whole all the plexiglass at one time uh, without having to do a bit change. Cutting on the outside of the line, it'll know to cut on the inside here for the uh, start hole. Uh, I've gotta make a change to my uh, trail, which we're gonna do in a minute, because uh, I gotta recalculate it anyway. But uh, we're going to uh, calculate that. And this is gonna be the plexi panel. Okay, so basically, you know, that would be the plexi panel with the start hole and all. Well, right now, the way my trail is, uh, if I drop that marble down in there, well, there's, it's not going to, you know, there's nothing for it to fall into. So I need to make my opening here uh, the same size. So right now, while I have the plexiglass panel uh, holes selected, right now i'm going to move those over to another layer um a new layer and it's going to be called my plexi panel and i'm going to uh click ok and that way i can on my trail here my offset layer my trail i can take this guy and make a copy of it copy do that offset layer and what that allow me to do is if I turn off the plexi panel you know vectors as well as the tool pass um, I now have a vector here that I can trim to and I want my marble when it drops in the hole to be able to kind of do its thing so we're gonna just basically take our scissor tool and you know trim that up so when we drop the marble in it'll go good there now same thing with the finish hole. Um, I, that finish hole is being cut into the wood, so it's already there. I really don't need to trim this uh, and everything. I'll just leave that as it is. Now, let's take this um, trail and recalculate it. Uh, this trail is going to start, start at an eighth of an inch down. That's where that pocket, because we're going to do the pocket cut first. And then it's going to cut that 0.3125, which should give me enough clearance underneath all the way around my marble so it'll roll freely. Uh, and we're still going to use that quarter inch in mill. We're going to calculate that tool path. Okay, so we'll have our marble trail there. 
and then our plexiglass panel can now cover that trail and entrap that marble in there so it can only go, you know, so many places. Um, and there we have a very simple marble maze. Now, some people have taken it a step further. Uh, that hole that drops through, you could do this as a two-sided job to where when that marble drops through, there's another plexiglass panel with another set of trails on the back side, you know, where it's a two-sided maze uh, to get to the finish line. You have to you have to find your way to the hole to drop to the back side, and then you got to find your way through the the maze on the back side to get to the finish line. Uh, and you know that makes for a pretty cool uh, game as well. Um, and so, if we look at this uh, straight on. Not a very complicated maze. You can absolutely mix and match it up. You know, add some more dead ends and trails. There's some spaces here. We have some open spaces where we could add some, you know, little false trails and things like that. Uh, we could make it a little bit more complicated, but this is the basic concept of creating a, ma uh, a maze. Here's what we've learned tonight. One, the offset tool becomes our friend uh, and relieves us of a lot of snipping. Two, uh, we can absolutely use the grid to help at least get our polyline, our trail laid out. And then we can eliminate that grid or put it on its own layer that we can turn off. Uh, and then we just go through and join up, you know, those offsets, close them off at the ends and things and do a little of trimming that we have to do. Uh, but that saves us a lot of time and stuff. So thank you for that, John. Um, yes. Um, John even said here in the path, uh, uh, have the marble drop to the other side where you can, there's another maze. Exactly. Um, Lindsay says, uh, you have a soft radius on the outside of the walls. Do the inside walls need the uh, soft radius as well? And so, uh, her question is, is on this marble trail, we have that radius on the outside. Uh, do we want to create uh, the radius on the inside of the trail? Uh, we could, absolutely. We're not going to be able to get a full, uh, you know, um, radius. I think we should be able to get about uh, maybe a quarter of an inch. So, but we can absolutely do that. It's not required but it may make the trail look more aesthetically pleasing instead of having soft corners, hard edges, soft corners, hard edges, right? So let's go through and take a quick look at that. Um, we're going to use the fillet tool for this. Uh, the fillet tool, we are, uh, let's first check out what our outer radiuses are. Uh, let's see here if I take my measurement. Sorry, not that tool. Uh, my measure tool. Oh, let's see how. Point one five six three, which is half of the three thirty seconds. So point one five six three. Here's the radius right here. Point one five six three. All right. So let's see if we can obtain that on all of the corners. So we're going to use our fillet tool. Uh, we're going to go point one five six three, and uh, let's go ahead and oh, wrong fillet. That's a dog bone fillet. We need a normal fillet there, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, let's go ahead and um, go through and and so we would go through creating our radius. Now that one we lose it. Okay, we can't get a uh, 0.15 radius out of it. So let's. <clears throat> We'll put a smaller radius there. Uh, let's go with a let's 
go with a sixteenth of an inch. Yep. All right, point one five six three. We're uh, not gonna get it there um, or there. And get that one. We're, uh, these are going to be 0.1563 or something. We may have to, uh, let's see if I can get it. I can't get it out of there either. That'll make me lose that. So let's go with a uh, 16th of an inch again. Let's give it a nice rounded edge there. And we can continue that all the way through um, with our fillet tool. So, okay. So we could continue that, you know, where we where we can obtain it, uh, you know, to see if uh, you know uh, find the areas where we can get that radius from, go through and clean up the areas where we can't, uh, type of deal. Um, and the, you know, anywhere we can't, we'll just, you know, deal with, uh, uh, with a, with a smaller radius or something. But, uh, it'll help, uh, you know. Give it a little bit more better aesthetic look. We can't get a uh, our radius out of there, but we can there. Not required, but hey, you know. So, not going to go through and do all of them. There's a couple uh, more to do. But if we go in there and recalculate this toolpath, well, you can uh, have those softer edges things. Let me get my view. Um, simulation let's set it up to extremely high and let's preview it's going to take a little bit longer to preview and while it's previewing let's uh Yes, uh, William, um, there you go, buddy. William, uh, you and John, uh, you get bonus points uh, for uh, tonight's class. William had an excellent idea. Why not uh, use the grid, it's in the Vetric software, to help draw your polylines. Now, that's excellent uh, for, um, that's an excellent idea. Let this finish uh, previewing. Come on now. It's a little bit higher quality simulation view, so it's taking a, a little bit longer to uh, simulate. And your trails, your, your, your um, pieces, they can be of any uh, size, any shape. Uh, you can you can get creative with the shapes and all rounded, um, you know, uh, mazes, uh, figure eights, whatever the case may be. 
you know you you can get really really creative with uh, what you're doing let this finish it's almost done but I like it William I like it John I like it William okay very good you guys are teaching me something tonight keep forgetting about these handy dandy tools in the vetric software so let that plow through all right so we can get rid of our waste material double clicking on your waste material will remove it uh, as long as there's not a tab attached to it and we have our polyline here but let's go back to our 2d view and let's take a look at this so for this I am going to turn off the offset and turn the marble trail back on just the marble trail and I'm gonna turn my grid on and so on our grid you know right now the grid uh, this particular grid as a default as a default under the snap options as a default grid spacing of a quarter of an inch okay which is, uh, you know, basically half, you know, of uh, the diameter. So, or of, of our half inch we're looking for. So, if we look at this, in this particular trail, uh, you can see that we're pretty, pretty close on this grid line here. And, uh, you know, we could have followed this grid line knowing that a quarter and a quarter is a half an inch. So our lines have to be two grid rows apart from each other because the center of our trail from center to center is a half an inch. So with, uh, with that, you know, we could do that and we could say, okay, skipping every, you know, two, or we could even take our snap options and change it to a grid spacing. 0.5 and now we can use our grid to snap to to create our uh, you know our polylines so we could come in and you know we could use our grid to create our path um, whatever it you know it may be and um, when we do we can take that uh, line and offset it both directions, creating our path. Slick as snot, right? Right, right, all right. So, laddies, that's what we get. So, Using a combination of our snap grid and a combination of our offset tool in both directions, we've got a very simple way to create a maze. Nicely done, guys. This is, this is what makes these classes so worth it is to be able to come in and teach something and then have someone come up and say hey what about this thinking and you know, with alternative thinking because there's not there's more than one way to get to a goal and whether you're a new user or an old user by saying hey what about doing this that means that you have learned you know uh, different methods and you've learned how to look at things and do things whether you learned it from me or you learned it from the vetric videos or you learned it from self-education you're learning you're progressing and to have uh, you guys uh, come out and say hey what about the offset tool both directions and hey what about our snapping grid you know just turning it on and using that awesome on both cases and those two combined make for a super simple way to create that puzzle path. So really, all we would have to do is, um, you know, have that, let's turn everything off here, have that grid laid out, half inch spacing if we're using a quarter inch diameter marble, of course, you know, do your math, you know, uh, whatever your marble size diameter is, 
add 25 percent to that and then that's your magic number you know that's what you're spacing on um but you know we could lay out our you know the actual project uh you know border we could you know create the um radiuses you know what you know whatever shape our, our you know our outside project is for me it was a two inch radius uh you know we could go in and create the handles right you know snap create the handles and then use our grid say okay this is we could define we could even define the playing area whatever it may be and then say okay here's where we go and then start drawing and snapping to your points offset that line in both directions and boom done nicely done all right so i don't think we need to go any more further into this uh i'm going to uh i'll create a nice little cool maze for you guys this one's a little basic and boring um i'll create a nice cool looking maze for you guys and girls and i'll provide those files in the facebook group as always uh for you to download and uh, carve and run it will be based on a inch and a half uh thick stock so you can glue two three quarter inch boards together whatever it may be and it will be based on having a quarter inch piece of plexiglass as a cover uh, and um, using, uh, assuming that we're using a quarter inch diameter ball bearing or marble. All right, so now let's, uh, we'll end that here. Uh, it's a good place to end it. At, uh, uh, it's, I didn't get, uh, uh, damn, an hour and 51 minutes. Okay, it's only supposed to be 45. All right, well, excellent. We learned something. Now, Let's go ahead and turn everything off. All the layers. Let's turn our grid off. And um, we're gonna create a new layer. And uh, I'm gonna call this my sample layer. All right guys, we're gonna open this up to a uh, Q and A. Uh, so any questions you got on any uh, particular task or anything that you um, are stuck on, uh, can't quite figure out, uh, fire those questions away and let's uh, let's see if we can answer them. Um, but uh, with Lindsay's combination of the soft radiuses, don't forget you can use your fillet tool for that, right? Uh, with William's uh, addition to the... Um, grid and with uh, John's uh, fabulous suggestion of using the offset tool those three combinations uh, make for a very very simple method for coming up with some very cool grid muzzle mazes mazes you know and things like that mazes so nicely done all three of you all right so I'm ready for you don't make them too hard I don't know all the answers, guys, but I will. This is the part where I will do my absolute best to answer your questions to the best of my ability. If there's any that you want to ask, absolutely ready when you are. And it doesn't have to be about uh, mazes, by the way, guys. It's I'm talking, this is an open Q&A. Uh, yeah, anything. While y'all are typing in your questions, <laughs> briefly speak to the 2018.04.24 beta for Windows. Uh, what is new in the um, that version? Uh, when we did the last class, we uh, I mentioned and referred to uh, downloading the .0404 version. Well, uh, it was discovered that there were a few little glitches in that. Not glitches. It's a bad way of saying it. Bugs. Um, one of the bugs was uh, that the little uh, step arrows uh, down in the bottom left of the software, when you push them, they, they would make the axis act erratic. Uh, the second bug was that the laser, if you were using our digital laser, um, it uh, wouldn't turn on and uh, the third uh, would be uh, would kind of be relative to uh, the router not turning off so uh, I reached out to Planet CNC 
showcased uh, these, uh, you know, Ayers and all, and uh, Andre is a fabulous man. We work together, uh, you know, uh, we help with beta testing and things like that. Um, and so he quickly uh, went through and took a look and found uh, the bugs, uh, corrected them, and that is where the point four, uh, you know, oh four two four beta version is. Uh, it was a repair or a uh, fix from the point oh four oh four. And so now you have the ability to add buttons, add custom features, um, add uh, you know custom tabs and things as you as you uh, you know from the point oh four oh four. But now you won't have. Uh, any, you won't run across any of those issues. They've been corrected um, in uh, the point two four. <clears throat> Last, uh, Lainey, this week my V-carve screen changed. The buttons have been moved. David, uh, your Vetric V-carve uh, screen changed or your... Um, your CNC USB controller. David uh, Kinsey. CNC USB controller. Yes, okay. Uh, CNC USB controller. David, you want to go to the uh, view menu next to file up at the top left. View. And uh, you want to go down to window. Uh, the window option in the view menu. And you want to go over to reset. And that will reset your window back to what you're uh, used to seeing. Uh, every once in a while when you open the program, uh, you, your buttons might get jumbled around in the CNC USB controller. But uh, the view menu down to window and over to reset uh, should uh, put them back into order. Peter, uh, Laney, with TNG, you set up uh, for me last week. I can't get it to touch off uh, with the touch off plate. It doesn't read the plate for the uh, 0.0100 height. Um, first off, Peter, uh, the uh, if you are using, let me know if you're using the Mini Carver or the 2440. Make sure that you are using, if you are using the uh, you know Mini Carver, that you are clamping your router bit onto the uh, uh you know that your your gator clip is getting clipped onto the router bit and if you're using the 2440 make sure your gator clip is grounded to the leg of the table if that is the case then we may need to go into your settings and we need to set up the sensor and that would be let's open up the tng software take a quick moment uh open that up and show you where that is you may get a black screen for a moment while i'm opening my program Let's make sure, let me make sure that the screen did not, you know, turn any funky directions or anything like that. Uh, it looks like it's still broadcasting okay. Um, so here in a moment you'll see that uh, pop in. So um, the first thing is, is in the settings, file settings. Hopefully it'll show the settings window when it pops up. Under jogging. Uh, I'm sorry, not jogging. <laughs> Under measure, want to make sure that your sensor, sensor one is set to uh, input pin two. Make sure that that has not changed or anything. Make sure that is still showing. Make sure the movable sensor down below does say 0 0.01 uh, for the movable sensor thickness, the size of it. And make sure that... Um, uh, in your I.O. tab, oops, in your I.O. tab, you the, it's a wonderful thing, that I.O. tab. Um, it's like a little diagnostics of your board. So on the input, input 2 should light up green when your sensor touches your router bit. So if your gator clip is connected to the router bit and you just take your touch plate and just touch it up against the router bit, input 2 on the I.O. tab should light up uh, green. Uh, saying that you have a continuity signal. If it does not, then we may need to check uh, for a short in your wire, 
you know, make sure the solder or anything hasn't come off the touch plate or anything like that, and, um, you know, kind of di diagnose it. And that's where you'd find that. <clears throat> okay. You said a 22 uh, degree V bit needs to be in the form tool. Why not the V bit, Jared? Uh, Jared, that's an excellent uh, uh, question. Excellent question. The what Jared's question is is in the uh, Vetric software. When we click on, let's say we click on new and um, V bit. Uh, why we can't just put in, you know, our angle of, uh, let me see, 22 degrees, right? And then the diameter. We need the diameter of, uh, not the shank, um, Jared. We need the diameter of the head of that V-bit at the widest part of the V, not the shank. So with the 22 degree V-bit, um, it, it, you know, it cherries. So you could try to set it up that way, but uh, it all depends on that uh, tool or cutter. Uh, let's say that in the specs of the router bit, that that V tool, that V tool has a cutting diameter, a cutting diameter of um, at the widest point of the cutter has a cutting length of, uh, I don't know, 5 sixteenths. Uh, you know, it's got a real sharp point. Uh, let's see if it, um, what would be a good one? I don't, here, I tell you what, let's do this. Let's open up uh, a tab real quick. Let's go find a bit with a spec. All right, so let's find, let's see if I can find an image. This will be a good one. All right, so we need to know the diameter of our bit, the cutting length. Um, oh, come on now. The angle, the side angle, and then the B, uh, which is our, uh, our, our cutting length you know, of that bit. We need to be able to draw that in. Um, if it was a regular V bit, then it's, you know, it's not taking an account like, you know, the 22, 30 degrees, you know, they all, they vary, you know, it just depends on the easiest way. And, you know, some bits have a blunt bottom. Some have come to a very sharp, fine point. Um, and the, um, the easiest way to do this is we know on this one here, we have an overall cutting depth of five eighths. It has a diameter of a quarter of an inch. Uh, this is an 18 degree. Let's go down here. Sorry. Uh, 22 degree bit with a cutting length of 0 .0648. 0 .0648, sorry. Quarter inch diameter. So that cutting length, if I, 0 .648, remember that number. If I come in here and my height is 0 .648, and a diameter of 0.25. I can use this rectangle here with my polylines to snap from this corner to the center and from this corner to the center. I actually don't need to do that. I can just finish off this line right here. I can get rid of that rectangle I can select that and open up my tool database and new form tool to put in that V bit and the parameters. 
you know, and I have an exact tool set for uh, my cutting height and everything. So it, it you can try it in the, the V-Carve, uh, you know, the V-Bit, just, you know, new V-Bit, you know, what have you. But some engraving bits, uh, you know, uh, those fine bits and everything, uh, it's better just to draw out the profile and use it as a form tool. I'm not saying that's the only way you can do it, but it's, you know, quicker and easier to make sure you're getting the exact specs of that bit in there okay so hopefully that answered your question all right so let's see here Lenny, are you going to IWF in August uh, I see Vetrick is going to be there uh, Burl and I uh, went to IWF last year and um, we're thinking about doing it again this year because it's a nice way for us to market uh, not market but uh, Oh, um, what, what's the call? What's it called? Um, oh, what's the word to catch up? If you, uh, I forget what the, the technical term is, but to catch up with, with the folks at Vetric and also, uh, the owner of the woodworking shows is going to be there, uh, looking at new and inventive things, uh, uh, innovative things and all. And so, uh, you know, a lot of the people that, that we know and, and that we, we want business ties with a man of tools, uh, you know, they have a big booth there and so we can meet with them and, and see what's new and all with them. So we may go to IWF, uh, this year. Um, we did last year, uh, Burl thought of, you know, talked about it for this year, uh, you know, whether we would go and, um, uh, you know, we, we may go. So network. Thank you very much, Floyd. <laughs> it gives us an opportunity to network with the companies that we are currently working with and meet new companies and things. So, uh, we may, we may do that. We may, we may be at IWF. All right. So, um, Peter, yes. Uh, if it does not work, uh, give me a call. Definitely give me a call in the morning and, uh, let's uh, jump on team viewer and take a look. William, uh, I know we can draw a profile of a bit, and add it to our tool database. Seems there would be a way to import a tool profile from a manufacturer such as Amana, Whiteside, or others. Well, if they have a um, a tool profile, uh, you know that uh, you can import a file. And I'll give you an example: um, Magnate. Magnate Tools uh, has, uh, let's see if I can go into my downloads. <clears throat> get down to my files here and go down to the R's, 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 R's. Let me import this file. It's a big file, a lot of router bits, so bear with it a second. Yes, uh, William, this year is Atlanta, and that's, that would be it. We would not go to the Vegas one. We, we would kind of wait till they're in uh, Atlanta, and it, it skips. It alternates uh, each year. All right, folks, stand by a second. Here we go. All right, so now if we were to look here, uh, Magnate has a DXF file of all of their router bit profiles. Um, which, you know, if there was a particular, and their tool numbers and things. Uh, and so, you know, if we were adding this form tool to our tool database, then we could, you know, just, uh, use, uh, you know, import this file in and, and, you know, use the right side of our, we'd have to, 
Uh, I never really uh, change uh, any of my profiles, but if I take these items here together and I join them as one, I got three vectors I just selected, I joined them as one. With that vector selected, I could open up my uh, tool, new form tool, and it would draw in that router bit, uh, you know, that profile and everything for me, that three inch diameter bit. Um, so the, um, you know, not all companies have this, you know, this library of DXF files of all of their router bits. Magnate took the time to create it for their router bit profiles, which is really nice of them to do. And they provided that file for people to, uh, um, you know, use and everything. So, and for a lot of this, I mean, you know, uh, quarter inch round over, you know, uh, it's a quarter inch round over. So, you know, it's a, it's a nice file that, that you know, to use. Um, and if, uh, you know, I tried to, with uh, Whiteside, tried to get them to make up a file like this and uh, we didn't get that done. Um, uh, Amana, I haven't talked with uh, our rep and Amana to see if we could get something like this created because Amana has a whole bunch of tools. Um, and I'm sure that they have some type of DXF file of those tools when they're, you know, when they're cutting them, you know, to make the tools and stuff. And if we could get that, and, and of course we wouldn't be able to get the whole catalog, but maybe, you know, some of the more common ones, if we could get those profiles in a DXF file like this or something, uh, that would be awesome. You know, it would be very, very cool. But, um, you're, um, William, you're not going to find uh, a, a database file or a DXF file like this or any kind of uh, uh, file that you could import in, um, you know, without having to draw it out. This is a magnate file. And like I said, they took the time to, because they don't have it, they don't carry a whole big line, but uh, the majority of the bits, you know, they created this DXF file. Okay. <clears throat> Um, and if anybody wants this DXF file from Magnate, um, I'll be happy to share it. You can also, I think you can still obtain it from their website, but, uh, um, I'd be happy to share it with you. All right, it, uh, I tried making a keyhole bit profile finally. At it. Now, hold on now, hold on. William, keyhole bit profile, you do not, uh, for a keyhole bit, you do not draw the profile in for that. You use a uh, an end mill um, and because you're using your keyhole tool path. Uh, maybe you're using the uh, gadget uh, in, in the Vetrix software for the keyhole gadget. It uses a generic end mill like your eighth inch or quarter inch end mill because it only pulls two things from that end mill. It pulls the speed, uh, the feed rate, should I say, and the plunge rate, uh, the speeds and feeds. Uh, other than that, um, the parameters of that keyhole bit are plugged in uh, in the gadget itself. So you would not, I mean, uh, even if you had the keyhole bit drawn and in your tool database, um, it would it would not uh, uh, it would not cut um, it would not cut correctly because uh, the toolpath has to have the bit go in, plunge down, go in, come back, and come back up through the same hole that it plunged out of. Um, so be and and your dovetail bits same way guys you wouldn't draw your dovetail bits in there, uh, and you know, um, because, I mean you could but that's just a you use a general end mill because of course Vetric can't simulate an undercut, you know, so you would use just a similar end mill and for that end mill you would be using your router bit, your uh, your v your your dovetail bit. 
you just use a generic end mill. Uh, 3 8 inch diameter. If my dovetail cutter at its widest diameter is 3 8 of an inch, uh, you know, um, then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have a 3 8 inch end mill that I'm using for uh, simulating the toolpath and creating the toolpath. Just when I'm at the router machining, I would be using my dovetail. So, um, exactly. Yeah, you just use a, a false end mill. And let me see here. My, my program, and I'm trying to delete this file. Um, let's see if I can, uh, while that's doing its thing, let me open up another instance of this. I believe my screen has frozen. Frozen, we'll see here. My screen has frozen, so bear with me, ladies and gentlemen. Um, that is a big file, that DXF file, and uh, it has locked up uh, my screen so bear with me a moment because all the vectors are broken up into little sections and things and the single line text and everything all right while that is uh, waiting while we're still looking at a blank screen um, I will uh, or a screen of uh, those router bits um, go ahead guys if you have any more questions uh, pop them up there and um, I'm gonna scroll through and make sure I didn't miss any okay come on DXF file delete that gummit All right, so let's, um, I believe my screen is still frozen. Let's go back uh, to my ugly mug for a moment and uh, let's continue on with some Q&A. Once my uh, local broadcaster screen catches up with itself, um, we'll um, continue on. Okay, we should be, uh, you should see that transition from me to the screen. And then let's talk about uh, keyholes for a minute. Um, Laney, for my keyholes, David Kinsey says, for my keyholes, I am still using my keyhole bit as an end mill uh, with a set plunge depth, then cutting length for the length I want uh, with one pass. Um, David, uh, what particular toolpath are you using to make sure the bit comes back to its original start point uh, before it raises up um, out of the same hole that it went into. With a keyhole gadget, we would create a hole, whatever size, uh, you know, I'll go 0.25 here, uh, just, to, just to show, just to identify where our entry point is going to be. Um, with the keyhole gadget, we would then define 
uh, if we want our hole to be uh, vertical from the bottom to the top, from that circle up, from that circle down, from the circle to the right or to the left. And then we would determine the depth of the slot. Now the depth of the slot is gonna be how deep it needs to go for the head to clear and uh, for the neck to be able to, you know, uh, to be able to do its cutting for the small narrow portion. So we need to know how deep. And my head of my keyhole bit uh, is about, um, you know, a little over an eighth of an inch. So I have it cutting a quarter of an inch deep. The length of the slot is how far that from that plunge, how far the length is going to be, uh, one inch in this case. The entry hole diameter would be the 0.375, the diameter of the keyhole uh, bit. And then the slot diameter would be the slot, the diameter of the neck of the keyhole bit that's cutting. And we would use a tool and notice how it says set up a dummy end mill to control speeds and feeds. So for me, I just use my eighth inch end mill for the speeds and feeds only. And when we calculate that tool path, it creates that tool path from the center of that circle that we first drawn. Notice how it drew its own vector here. It really didn't pay any mind to the size of my circle. It just used that center point of that circle for the start point. So the bit will plunge in, it will cut that one inch length, and then it will return to this hole before it raises up. So it's going, it's that green line here on the tool path, that is where it's raising, going down to the cut, and then also coming back and raising up on that green line. We don't wanna see a green line at this end because that means it's gonna come up and pop through that end. So, um, what, uh, David, let me know, um, you did, that's right. You did, David, you did send me the file to check it out. Uh, David Kinsey, um, what did we, what did we determine? Um, They, in the in the actual profile cut, there was a certain setting, I think. I don't know. Can you refresh my memory, David? Uh, what what we determined to make it come back? Let's let's take a look at that real quick. Let's kind of uh, if we were using a generic uh, keyhole bit without the without the gadget, uh, we would do a profile cut, cutting a quarter of an inch deep. Uh, along, let's draw a line. Okay, my start point, if I go into node editing on this line, my start point is here, the bottom. So it's going to start there. Now, uh, let's see here, we're going to be cutting on the line. Uh, I'm just going to use my end mill, generic end mill for the uh, speed and feed. Um, let's see here. I'm not going to have any leads. I'm not going to have any order. Start at, keep the start points. I'm not going to, I'm not going to select anything. I'm just going to use the default settings to calculate this tool path. And let's take a look. So right here. It's going in, coming out, and coming up here before it goes back home. So that wouldn't work for me. Let's go ahead and let's look at the order. And let's see if we can uncheck this and try the shortest path option. Okay, again, uh, that doesn't do it for me because it's going to come up out of the other end it's not coming back so uh one more time let's le let's see what other options we have leads add a lead uh straight line lead angle zero 
Maybe. Okay, that doesn't do it. That's not doing it for me. Bear with me. I'm looking for that point to go away and my start point. Um, start at uh, the keep the current start points, optimize start points, move start points to the closest, blah, blah, blah. Keep the current start point. know let's go with a 90 degree let's see what that lead does so far everything I've done is just created the same uh, okay what do we got here so We've got another point that just presented itself. That's the start point of the uh, toolpath. So we need to use the start point of the vector. See if I turn that toolpath off, that one will go away. Let's uh, figure out what uh, we need to turn back on so it doesn't create a secondary start path. We're going to turn off the leads. We're going to go with the Nope. Still wanting to uh, I don't know, David. We'll have to take a look at that. Uh, use a pocket toolpath for your key. Okay, well, let's take a look at that. Because um, the profile cut's not working for us. So David uses the pocket toolpath. Um... No, I don't, David. I uh, I don't anymore. Unfortunately, I'd like to. I'd love to look at it. Um, David uses a pocket toolpath. I'm assuming it's going to be a cut depth of 0 0.25, 0 0.25, with one pass. And. All right, that's an open vector. So how do you get around that one? Is it a single line or is it a rectangle you draw? Because it won't do it on a single line. So uh, we may have to draw a rectangle. Let's go a quarter inch. Okay, so this shows, if we slow it down, this shows one entry, one outro. So if we preview the selected toolpath, we'll speed it up a little bit. It's going to cut that depth. It's going to plunge down to that 0.25, cut that depth, and then return 
return back and raise up out of that hole. So there you go. So that's, uh, that's his workaround is the pocket toolpath. Nicely done. Okay. All right. So now, Bob, uh, let's go back up. And um, my machine stopped in the middle of a job today. I had to turn off TNG and start again. Uh, noted the line number and restarted at that line. Uh, it was giving me a disconnected control uh, box. Uh, I did it a few weeks ago also. So <laughs> what you have to understand about the connection between the computer and the control box is your uh, USB controller board, your MK34, your MK24 board is powered uh, by the USB port, not by the wall outlet that that control box is plugged into. And that USB port uh, sends out a five volt signal and that powers the, the board um, to um, uh, keep it uh, you know, uh, connected so you can run your machine and everything. If that voltage drops, if you lose connection in any way, uh, then the machine is going to stop. Uh, and so uh, key things to avoid uh, that happening is be sure to always be sure to always uh, run your uh, machine with your computer plugged into power, not running off a of battery. Because as that battery gets low, resources get pulled from the secondary, uh, you know, um, uh, ports and USBs and peripherals, uh, peripherals, and uh, get, you know, that battery power goes towards things like your processor, CPU, and all that stuff. Uh, so that voltage is going to drop, you know, so uh, and you'll end up losing signal if that 5 volt signal drops. Now, uh, a couple of ways that you can avoid that is uh, some people have used uh, powered uh, USB plugs um, where the, uh, the USB cable actually has a, uh, a DC power outlet that plugs into the wall. Um, and it sends a continuous signal. The signal is fed off of that uh, power supply versus off of the actual USB port itself. Um, that you know that will help uh, uh, keep that from happening. Um, but anytime your voltage drops, your signal, your board stops, your machine stops. You know you lose communication. Even if it's for a millisecond, you know it's done. Um, that signal drops. So um, when it says control box not connected. You know, or, or controller not connected, or controller not found, or whatever, uh, it just stops dead on you. That's you, typically what it is. And USB ports on computers do become weak over time, uh, and things. Uh, but uh, always check and make sure you know your your uh, USB cable's not bad. Make sure uh, you know going bad. You know, uh, you know, getting damaged going bad. Um, pins and things like that. But if you're uh, worried about that, you can always find uh, those powered USB uh, hubs and stuff uh, that uh, feed off a power outlet for that five volt signal. Um, all right, so let's see here. Since I don't know how, that's where I use a rectangle also, I had a plunge uh, path down and went uh, and then back then out with the rectangle was 0 0.0001. So William, uh, most likely just drawing a rectangle the length of how long you want the keyhole slot to be um, using the pocket tool path will give you the results that you need. You know, just like David does, you know, rectangle. So, for your keyhole, if you're not going to use the gadget, you just want to use the keyholes bit without having to use the gadget to create your slot. Draw a rectangle, um, the size of the bit you're going to use for the feeds and speeds. Get a rectangle in there, the length that you want that slot to be, knowing that it's going to plunge in here and cut to that length. Um, and pocket toolpath, that will uh, allow that bit to come in, make the cut, 
and then come back and retract out of that hole. There you go. All right, so, um, okay, good, uh, Bob. If your laptop's always plugged in the mains and everything, um, you know, uh, you may want to check your USB cable, your USB ports, change to a different USB port, or look into uh, Amazon and look into one of those powered hubs. Um, on Amazon, uh, there's not any particular one that we would recommend, uh, you know, any of them. Uh, Amazon. Dot com. Powered USB hub. With AC adapter, very key. Um, if we look at So here's a powered USB 3.0, uh, four port uh, splitter with a five volt, three amp powered adapter. Okay, five volt, three amp powered adapter. Um, you have, you know, uh, here's a 3.0, even 2.0 if you want to find 2.0, but 3.0 is fine as well. Um, but any of these uh, with a five volt, uh, power adapter should work fine for you if you want to go that route. All right. Uh, didn't know there was a gadget. Yeah, William, uh, under your gadgets, you have lots of gadgets. You have uh, things uh, like drag knife gadgets, uh, keyhole gadgets, wrapping gadgets for your fourth axis if you have one, um, uh, DXF batch processor gadget, the spiral gadget, gear maker gadget, dovetail creator, chamfer, and then the box creator. And you can always install new gadgets. Uh, gadgets are free add-ons from the Vetric website. Um, these uh, for in the vetric.com by the way I'll show you a couple of things on vetric vetric um, under support they've got a tips and tricks video library tips and trick video library if you've never seen it uh, this is not like your tutorial library this is a tip and trick uh, tutorial library uh, to give you some little tips and tricks on some of your, uh, you know, like tracing images and, um, uh, you know, selection box directions, shortcut keys, snapping, um, 3D model structures and things like that, uh, distorting text and stuff. Uh, be sure to check that out. Uh, very cool little uh, library of videos that uh, you might not have known about. Um, but if we go over to... Um, downloads and gadgets and we visit the gadget library you'll find gadgets like uh, the fluter gadget which we already have a fluting toolpath uh, creator inside of our uh, Vegic software version 9 and stuff we don't need that uh, anymore um, valence gadgets uh, square around um, a grid importer for like if you're doing probing and it's a you know a point cloud uh, 3 to a 3d component uh, that we can use and um, let's see here the box creator is a pretty cool gadget you know for making boxes and stuff the chamfer gadget dovetail gadget uh, texturing toolbox the half toner is pretty cool uh, the half toner basically takes and uh, creates a dot pixeled uh, layout of an image uh, that you can use uh, with your software and it creates the image by drilling a series of holes with a v-bit or a ball nose bit and the darker the color of the image the deeper and the wider the hole is that's drilled um, which is uh, pretty slick you know and so uh, it, it, it takes and turns it into a hole matrix uh, so that uh, you know it will go through and uh, drill a series of holes um, you know depending on the colors and everything of how deep those holes would be to create stunning cool images and stuff 
So that's a pretty, the half toner gadget's pretty neat. And all these gadgets are free add-ons that you can download and add to your Vetric software. Now the only software that does not have access to the gadget library is the Vetric VCarb desktop software. It does not have access to the gadgets. Um, Howard Groves, that gadget is on Pro, right? Not desktop, exactly. Pro and Aspire have access to the gadget library. Uh, the desktop does not have access to the gadget library or gadgets. So you would, if you were using, if you wanted to make a keyhole slot, you would use the uh, shortcut of using a pocket toolpath, drawing your rectangle and stuff, and, and, and that way that David and them have uh, shared with us tonight. Yep. Uh, well, be sure. I mean, we can we can definitely look at some uh, 3D classes and stuff. But look at those tutorials. But we can also, uh, you know, I've got a, I haven't done a 3D class in a while, building models and all. Um, the um, uh, we can uh, we can definitely weigh them. You know. So Howard um, Groves Pro work on your mini CNC? Absolutely. Absolutely, you can pay the three hundred and twenty-five dollars, and you can upgrade from the Vetric VCard desktop to the Pro. And what that gives you is not only do you have access to the gadget, but now it allows you to exceed the cutting area of your mini by the use of tiling. So with the desktop software, you have a size limitation of twenty-five inches by twenty-five inches, right? You have a cutting area on your mini carver of eighteen by twenty-four. Well, let's say that this was the cutting area of my mini carver and I wanted to do a long board. Maybe I wanted to do a 16 inch board, uh, 16 inch wide board that was, uh, you know, four foot long or what have you. Well, I can now create that design in Pro and I can use the tiling toolpath, the tiling toolpath to break that toolpath up into sections and it would be feeding through the X axis and all and I can now, it will break my board up, that, that whole project, like tile one right here, right? And then uh, uh, let's go with, um, let's make this six inches just to show the, you know, like I've got tile one here, tile two, and so on and so forth. Uh, it will break up that design into full sections and stuff. So Pro gives you the ability to exceed the cutting limit of your CNC on the X axis. Uh, to do longer signs and things as well as it gives you access to the gadgets uh, Library and it also gives you nesting you have a nesting tool. That's not in the uh, Desktop software as well So a lot of a lot of uh, a lot of benefits to upgrading to pro from desktop And it's a three hundred and twenty five dollar upgrade All right, guys and girls. Well, um, I don't see any more questions pop up. Uh, let me know. We'll, we'll give it another two more minutes. Uh, pop a question in there if you got a question. If not, we're going to call it a night at uh, here at uh, nine about nine forty-five. Uh, we've been at it for a little while, but um, I was hoping you guys had some. Uh, we're loaded with questions and had some things you want to learn or ask about. Maybe uh, next week we'll do another one of these with a project class and with a big open Q&A at the end and uh, give you guys an opportunity to come up with some questions. Um, Bob Hill, can John McMillan use the half toner for his picture he wanted to do? He has VCar Pro. Sure. Uh, I, I don't know what picture we're referring to, uh, Bob. I'd have to look at the post and all. But uh, the half toner gadget uh, is a great little gadget that you could use. All right, what does nesting do? Uh, what does nesting do? So nesting allows us to uh, bring in um, or create multiple parts and then organize those parts in a way that we uh, can minimize our waste and maximize our yield. 
So let's say for instance, uh, let me see if I can import a file uh, that I have. Bear with me. Galloping horse, generator, Greek, laning, go to images. It's hiding here somewhere. Documents, that's where it's hiding. Documents. All right, in my documents, I should have a download uh, called. Oops, not that one. Where's my other class file? Show class right here. Thank you. Um, oh, not laser router. Inches. Uh, DXF half inch scale is fine. Okay. So all of these parts here. So let's say that my board, let's get my board appropriately sized here. So let's say I'm gonna be cutting this off out of a 24 inch by 24 inch piece of material, whatever the case may be, um, and click OK. And so I have all of these parts. Now the first thing I need to do is these parts are scaled up for a half inch uh, piece of material um, and I want to uh, scale them down. I want to size them down uh, to a smaller size. So I'm going to go 50%. And I am in the millimeter, so let's actually delete that because I'm a goofball. Let's go back and let's import that file again. Oh, I was an inch. I was an inch. Well, there we go. All right. So now I have all of these files uh, for this peg, all these parts uh, for this Pegasus, uh, you know, uh, carving. And so first thing I need to do is I need to group together my uh, pieces that have inner parts and all. When I nest, I don't want them getting moved around and stuff. So I'm going to go through and group these uh, group that one. Group that one. We'll group all these. Let's grab all these guys. So these parts have to be grouped together. When they have inside parts, they're grouped together individually. Um, you know, so they stay together. So we've got to go through, and that's a little bit of prep work. I'm not going to do them all. Uh, I'm just going to grab some of them so we can nest them together. Group. Uh, let's take group that one together. We'll take this one and group it together. Oh. And this last one here as well as one of these wings. We'll take one of these. All right, so <clears throat> let's say I take my grouped objects and I'll go ahead and select them. In this case, I would normally, um, 
All right, these three are grouped together. They should not be. So ungroup and Well, how did I do that, ladies and gentlemen? Ungroup. I'm going to take these two guys, move them over here. Select this third one here. He's getting a little involved. Well, damn. Y'all letting me group all these things together? All right, that one's grouped. Uh, this one here should be grouped by itself. That one's grouped by itself. This one I could have picked a less complicated design for showing how to use the nesting tool, but give me a second. All right, <clears throat> so I'm going to take uh, these items here, this guy here. This one, that one, I'll take uh, these legs here and parts and this wing. So let's imagine that I, you know, we were doing all these parts. So I'm just going to do what's selected in the nesting tool. Uh, I'm going to be using a, uh, this is an eighth inch scale. I'm going to be using an eighth inch diameter end mill to cut these uh, parts out. Uh, no, actually I'm going to be using a 16th inch end mill. So the diameter is going to be a 0.625. Um, <clears throat> my clearance, how much clearance do I want between each piece? Um, I could probably get away with a 0.375 clearance around each one of the parts. And I want them to be away from the edge of my board by about a quarter of an inch. My border gap, that's what our border gap is. Uh, we can rotate the parts for best fit onto my board. Um, we, I don't want to mirror any of the parts for best fit, but I could if I wanted to, and I can go ahead and preview this on these selected items and it will go through and nest them. Uh, so parts one, two, three, and four will not be able to fit on my board at all, uh, because my board is not the appropriate size. Did I not size that? No, I didn't. Hold on a minute. Thought I did. All right, let's try that again. All right. So let's uh, open that nesting tool again, uh, 0.625, everything is the same. Uh, preview this, it will go through and it will nest those parts and organize them in a way that they, you know, that they'll fit onto the material. Now, of course, um, one of the hooves of the foot actually got, didn't get grouped together. That's why you have to group those parts together because the hoof, these hooves don't belong here. But everything fit except for this last leg so it had to, it created a second sheet for me over here in this top corner and so one of the things i could look at is uh, what if i change my rotation what if i uh, decrease my clearance in between each parts can i get that part to fit in maybe if i go with a 45 degree angle uh and um uh see if that works um let's let's see if um i go with a 45 degree angle and preview that am i going to be able to get them all in okay so no i got most all of them except for the wing now so most likely we'll have to decrease the angle so let's go with a five degree and you just all you're trying to do is maximize your yield and minimize your waste um and so if i were to come in here and let's preview this. All right, so 
It would take two sheets, uh, you know, based on everything. Uh, it would take two sheets to cut this out. So sheet one and sheet two. Sheet two will just have this part here uh, getting cut out of it. Now, uh, that will, it basically organizes the parts um, in a way that uh, I can, you know, separate and increase the extra sheets for me that I need. And of course I have all my other parts that, you know, would most likely take two and a half sheets for this. But here's the cool thing about nesting. Let's say that, uh, let me undo this, control Z here. And I want to uh, draw a vector. Let's say that in the corner of my board, there's a project that I wanna get done. So I'm gonna just use this top half right here. Okay, this this area. And I want to nest all these parts on my board, but I wanna keep that area open because of the fact that I'm gonna do a different type of carving on that area on that particular board so I, you know, not wasting it or what have you. Um, in the nesting tool, I can come over here and I can use a, the last vector that I select is the nesting boundary, right? where I can restrict these parts to go to and all. And so it should, uh, if I select this vector last, um, if I preview this, we might get an error because those parts might not fit in. I think it's gonna boundary around them. There we go. Uh, so it nests around that corner so I could be carving out my horse parts out of this board and out of each board, I could be doing a V carve or something or whatever, you know, for that one section. And, uh, you know, knowing that that one V carve or whatever sign or design it was is going to waste a lot of plywood, right? You know, on a 24 by 24 inch piece, I always have this scrap piece left over. Well, now I can isolate the area that I'm going to be carving and then I can use that scrap for a, another project uh, and do it all at the same time and just have that boundary uh, protected when I'm doing nesting and it's going to nest the parts. Uh, keeping that area untouched on all of my all of my sheets and all so really neat uh, neat neat nesting tool um, and so not ready for the fourth axe not ready for fourth axis question yet there you go uh, in nesting what does it do for tabs or would you best use double sided tape well William uh, the when we are doing this, uh, let's say that we're doing profile cuts, you know, on these parts. Let's say, you know, on all of them, whatever the case may be. And I create my profile toolpath with my 16th inch end mill. <gasps> oh, got the hiccups. Um, I am coming in and I'm going to be on the outside of the line, of course. And I'm adding those tabs in. So nesting has nothing to do with me creating my toolpath. It just allows me to, it helps me, you know, space and sort out everything. Uh, now I'm going to, you know, I come in and I create my tabs and I come through and add tabs where I need tabs, you know, on the parts and stuff. Um, you know, I'll come through and add the tabs and then calculate that toolpath, you know. So when it cuts it out, um, they'll be, you know, tabbed and stuff. Okay, so the nesting doesn't do anything for tabs. Uh, you you create your tabs uh, when you're uh, creating your profile toolpath. Would you, did you? With me? All right. All right. So that's what nesting is. Nesting is a great way. I mean, there's certain projects. I know there's certain projects that I do that uh, you know are out of you know I usually cut them out of a large panel and it only takes up a section of that panel so I always have you know one section missing well why not while I have that panel on the table if there's another project that I can fit into you know that waste area um, why not you know why not take advantage of it while it's on the table you know what I mean so that's what nesting does for us. Oh, 
All right, ladies and gentlemen. Well, we're going to go ahead and end with that uh, little tidbit of information. Um, I, uh, William, you just let me know when you're ready for a fourth axis uh, question. We can do that in another fourth axis class or something. Um, but, uh, or you can always call me one on one. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you very much for your class, uh, your time this evening and, uh, be sure to play around with the maze, uh, creating uh, some custom mazes and things, uh, which would be very cool. Uh, be sure to, uh, definitely, um, uh, check out the new, uh, options we have of the, using your grid, your offsets. You know, to draw, you know, when you're drawing your poly, your offsets and all, and just be sure to always, whatever marble you're using or ball bearing, give yourself about 25 uh, uh, percent uh, more room, you know, around that marble. Uh, so, and once again, when we're when we're drawing that, um, basically, let's say that I have a quarter inch diameter marble. Let's uh, try it down here. Quarter inch diameter marble. 0.25 um, then with that selected we would open up the size tool and on the percentage box uh, we would just type in 125 uh, percent and um, you know we can create that get that size that we need for our trails right that 0 0.3125 that's the size we need for our trails if we're going to use a quarter inch marble so on and so forth so very simple um, if you uh, uh, ever need anything just give me a call and uh, I'll be happy to walk you through it all uh, Howard all right you guys and girls have a wonderful night I want to thank you very much for your time and uh, enjoy your evening and uh, tomorrow uh, today is uh, Wednesday if I'm not mistaken so we will see you again on Monday. I'm not going to be on the road, so we will not miss or have a canceled class on Monday. Uh, and uh, be sure if you're in the Vermont area, we're going to be in Vermont next week. And um, if you're in the Vermont area and you're coming to our show or going to come see us and stuff and you want to order something and uh, want to save a little bit on shipping and pick it up at the show, be sure to let us know before we leave the facility, right? You know, give us, uh, we're going to be, our Vermont show is um, the 11th and 12th, Friday and Saturday of May. Uh, and so we're going to be on the road that, you know, uh, Monday or Tuesday, the 8th or 9th or whatever. So uh, be sure to, um, if you are going to be in that area, we're going to be in uh, um, Essex, Vermont, Essex Junction, Vermont. Uh, and you want to pick up something at the show to save money on shipping, place your order and uh, let us know you're picking up at the show and we'll make it happen. All right. Uh, we're going to be in Frederick, Maryland, uh, June 2nd and June 3rd. And we're going to be in uh, Boonsville, New York, August 17th through the 19th. Uh, Oshkosh, Wisconsin, September 6th through the 8th. And Seven Springs, Pennsylvania, September 14th and 16th. So... Uh, we're going to be in uh, Cambridge, Ohio in October, later this year. And uh, be sure to check us out if you're in the area and we're at the shows. All right. You guys have a great evening and good night.